Welcome to Privacy versus the Pandemic, a podcast hosted by Perkins Coie attorneys exploring privacy issues in the context of the COVID-19 outbreak. In this series, we'll talk about approaches to contact tracing, explore how transparency and consent are being addressed, and look at the extent to which existing regulations speak to these and other privacy-related issues that are emerging as a result of COVID-19. We connect with colleagues and friends from a few different countries in order to gain an international and multidisciplinary view of these issues. Visit PerkinsCooey.com for more information on our privacy practice. Please note that the opinions expressed in this podcast are our own and don't reflect those of the firm, and that nothing in these discussions should be considered legal advice. Welcome back to our podcast, Privacy Versus the Pandemic. My name is Jennifer Decker, and I'm a privacy attorney at Perkins Coie. I'm here with my co-hosts, Miriam Farhi and Amanda Mobran, who are also privacy lawyers at Perkins. In this episode, we'll talk to Cyrus Habib, Lieutenant Governor of the state of Washington. In addition to being the Lieutenant Governor, Cyrus is also a lawyer and an educator with an incredibly accomplished background. In our conversation with Cyrus, we discuss his views on contact tracing and his work to advocate for and support the use of masks. Unlike many of the other folks we interviewed for our podcast, Cyrus is not a proponent of contact tracing, so this interview really offers a new perspective. That's right. Cyrus provides a unique perspective, and in doing so, he also gives us a good overview of the test, trace, and isolate strategy that's been embraced in Washington state. He then shares his personal views as to why that's not the most effective mechanism for stopping the spread of COVID and why instead he's chosen to focus on masks. That's interesting. What are some of the reasons he's opposed to contact tracing? Well, to begin with, he's skeptical that there will be widespread adoption of a contact tracing app in the U.S. and specifically in Washington state. Cyrus talks to us about the public's general lack of trust and confidence in the government's data handling practices. And in Washington, this is especially true in light of a recent government agency data breach. He also talks about the amount of testing that would be required in order to effectively carry out a test, trace, and isolate approach. And we aren't anywhere close to having tests available for the general population in order to make that work. Well, those certainly are real challenges that could cut against the effectiveness of contact tracing. So let's listen to our conversation with Cyrus and hear more about why we should consider a new approach and embrace masks as the primary method for stopping the spread of COVID. I'm Cyrus Habib. I'm the Lieutenant Governor of Washington State. I was born in Maryland. My parents were immigrants to the U.S. from Iran. I grew up in Maryland and then in Washington State, which is where I went to middle school and high school and graduated, went to Columbia and Oxford and Yale for my higher education. Yale's where I got my law degree. And uh, law school is when I met Miriam because we were summer associates together at Perkins Coie during the first of my two summers with the firm. And it's the only firm that I ever worked for. And I came back after law school and uh, took a full-time job first in a litigation practice for a couple of years and then in a business practice working in the emerging companies group at the firm, working with startups for a couple of years. And during That period is when I ran for an open seat in the State House of Representatives, representing the Microsoft suburbs of Seattle. So Redmond, Bellevue, Kirkland, Washington. I served in the State House for two years, and then I ran for the State Senate, served there for two years, and then ran for Lieutenant Governor in 2016. And, um, you know, during my time in the legislature, because of my background working at Perkins and also because of my district, I I spent a lot of time working on tech-related issues. So I authored our state's equity crowdfunding law. I authored our state's rideshare legislation that allowed companies like Uber and Lyft to operate and put regulations on those companies to make sure that passengers stay safe and drivers stay safe. So I really had this interest in the intersection of technology and public policy, which is why I think the firm is doing such a wonderful job in uh, not only being... A wonderful counsel to its clients, but also being so engaged in public debates, whether it's in D.C. or in state legislatures or around the world, in Europe and in Asia, on these issues. So it's a pleasure to be able to join you all and discuss just one facet of that intersection of technology and public policy. I serve both as president of our state senate and also in the executive branch. I'm independently elected from the governor, but I partner with the governor and my office works, especially at a time like this when we're managing a crisis, we work to support the governor's office and to be in partnership with them. 
And our focus has really been on deployment of masks and really addressing the need for masks in workplaces where we have essential workers. We kind of began with a uh, program to engage Washingtonians in making homemade masks to be distributed. And that's been quite successful, cloth face masks. And then as we've done that, we've been able to partner with businesses who've donated fabric and materials and then also manufactured masks. And so we, we've uh, been kind of the clearinghouse for that part of the state's response. That's such an important initiative and something that I know you jumped on right away, especially at a time where there was mixed messaging about kind of the efficacy of using masks and whether people needed to wear masks. And now, fast forward several months we're seeing this widespread adoption of wearing masks out in public. And you were right at the cutting edge of, of that initiative in Washington State, which is incredible. Some of the other things that the governor has been proactive about using to stave off new cases and curb the pandemic is testing and contact tracing, which to date has largely been done through interviews in, by phone or in person after someone tests positive for covid can you talk a little bit about how Washington State has been using these techniques? Yeah, well, I think first it's it's important to back up and and to mention that you know we were the first state in the country to identify a COVID case, but also tragically the first state uh, to lose somebody to the coronavirus. And I think first of all, I'm pretty convinced that we probably weren't the first place. Uh, or that there's no reason to believe that we were the first place in the country to have a COVID-19 positive case. But we were the first to detect one because of pre-existing investments in public health in partnership with the Gates Foundation and others. And I think that's really important because as we look back on, you know, how different states within the U.S. reacted, I think it's important to recognize what pre-existing conditions existed. And so we had already in place the kind of public health infrastructure to test individuals with certain concerning symptoms to be able to detect those cases early. We also had in place a statewide paid uh, sick leave law, one of the few states that has that. And that meant that when we were aware of what we were dealing with, people were encouraged if they had symptoms, even if they didn't know, they hadn't been tested, but they had symptoms that could have been the flu or could have been COVID-19, that they were able to feel comfortable staying home for a few days and uh, not spreading the disease at work without, you know, needing to worry about what it would mean for their paycheck. And so I just want to highlight some of those investments that our state had made early on, because what it meant was that even though we had a couple really bad super spreading incidents and locations we were very quickly able to flatten the curve and, in fact, be one of the success stories nationally. Certainly, to to your question, you know, the governor took very seriously the advice of public health experts in saying that short of a vaccine or a cure, that test, trace, and isolate was the way out of the shutdown, uh, you know, the stay-at-home order that he issued. And we were one of the first states. Well, we were the first to issue certain stay-at-home orders, like for for school kids. And then we were one of the first three on closing down workplaces, et cetera. And so we've known since mid-March that the way that we can reopen responsibly is, uh, short of a vaccine and a cure, is to uh, build up some kind of a test, trace, and isolate paradigm. I will say that I have my own views on that. I I have a slightly different view than what's uh, been uh, kind of the mainstream position of the governor and other governors around the country. But I don't discount the importance. I think in in any case, testing, tracing, and isolating are very useful. It's, It's a very useful paradigm. What are some of the shortcomings you see with that paradigm? My issue with it is that it doesn't do anything to stop transmission. In and of itself, testing and tracing don't do anything to stop transmission. Of course, isolating people once we've discovered that they test positive, that does. But by that point, you know, you're you're coming in pretty downstream from significant spread. 
The reason I've been so adamant about and the reason why my, my office took the lead on masks is that, in my view, prophylaxis is the most important modality short of a vaccine. Um, and that, you know, when you think about the need to address the public health crisis and also the economic challenges that we face, in my view, masks are simply the only way responsibly to address both of those things. And so in an ideal universe, what would have happened is that the federal government would have initiated a massive investment in N95 or at the very least surgical grade mask production and distributed masks to every American. And governors would require that people wear those masks whenever in public, certainly whenever going into a business, going to work or going to a store, retail, whatever it might be. And you could largely open the economy and people wearing these masks, you can virtually eliminate the spread of the disease. And then look, and then testing and tracing will be much more effective in that context. And I think that's, you know, the response, and I know you've spoken to, to folks from South Korea, so, you know, you may be able to shed some light on this, but it seems to me like that's the part of the South Korea story that doesn't get told, is that people want to talk about test, trace, and isolate, but we need to remember that's also a place where masks are taken very seriously. In the context of wearing masks, a mask mandate, you'd be able to eliminate the number of positive cases to the point where you could reasonably use test, trace, isolate. But without that, you really can't. It's, it's an extremely unwieldy process with lots of holes through it and is not going to get us to a point where we can fully reopen our economy. We're going to be stuck kind of wavering between phase one and phase two until we can get a vaccine. Do you see masks alone as the answer for reopening and getting back to life as normal? Or do you see this as one pillar in a multi-pillared strategy? I think of masks as the most important. I think sh short of a vaccine, I think masks are the most important. You know, certainly then layering testing and so on and, and uh, is, is useful. But here's the thing about testing. In, and this is not just me opining because I certainly don't have the, you know, the, the education or the background to be able to opine on these things knowledgeably, but this is based on everything I've read and every conversation I've had with a public health official is that it'd be one thing if we were testing the general population. So I believe it was Paul Volcker who came out with this plan that involved 22 million tests a day in the United States. So essentially every American would get tested every 14 days, every two weeks. That's the general population. And, and he said, if you do that, and then you combine it with some tracing, then we can get this disease under control to a point where you could reasonably reopen the economy at scale. But I mean, we are at a tiny fraction of that. I mean, we are lucky that now we're in a position where we can say, if you need a test, you can get a test. But we're not requiring tests. We're not providing them to the general population. And so by the time someone has symptoms, if they even volunteer to get tested, as you know, with the latency period of this virus, they well may have been spreading this disease for a week. And now to go back and try to trace, or two, and to go back and now try to trace all the people whom they have interacted with, if they can remember, which, you know, most of us can't remember what we had for lunch yesterday. But to be able to go back and try to figure out, you know, whom you've interacted with over the past week or so, and then try to figure out and then try to get them to voluntarily get tested and then try to get them to figure out who they've been into. Again, I think if you had a very, very small segment, a sample size, then it might be workable. But it's, to my mind, masks like mosquito nets for malaria or condoms in HIV are our single best way of preventing spread of the disease, spread, preventing transmission at the point of human contact. You know, one of the things your comments allude to is just how difficult it is to use manual contact tracing at scale. Like, given how quickly this virus spreads, how many people are impacted, picking up the phone and trying to 
do contact tracing by phone interviews and relying on people's memories to indicate who they've been in contact with over the last 14 days seems pretty unrealistic. And so I'm curious to know your thoughts on, okay, we've heard your thoughts on shortcomings of testing and tracing, but what about digital contact tracing? Mm -hmm. So relying on technologies that are, you know, running on your phone, using Bluetooth signals to identify devices that are within a certain range from your phone and that being a more accurate and scalable method to identify people who may be exposed? I mean, I think there's a lot of challenges with that. I mean, first of all, I think the biggest challenge is just cultural. It's not something that, I mean, if, you know, if you think getting people to wear a mask is hard, culturally. I mean, it's funny, like people will tell me when I, when I, when I make my points about masks, they say, oh, but you know, in America, it's, it's just not our culture and, and it's so hard and people view it as being afraid and there's this machismo and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, well, that's true. But if you think getting people to wear masks is hard, just wait till you try to get a critical mass of, I mean, I'll just speak for Americans, Washingtonians, to install an app on their phone and to have the app running and to have it sharing data with the government. And that's to say nothing of how effective it would then be at determining where there was the type of contact that would be problematic. It's to say nothing of the downstream uh, uh, concept or the downstream events that would need to take place. So you would then need the uh, identified parties who may have contracted to take certain steps. And I think that's another major issue here is that, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that if you, if you reopen the economy under a test trace isolate paradigm, one person who tests positive, it's, it's pretty likely that then, you know, you're going to have to test everyone in that, that person's office, uh, obviously everyone in that person's home. And, and those, are the, those are the arenas where, it, where it's kind of it's identifiable. You've got challenges in, in uh, mass transit contexts, in large retail contexts, et cetera, where uh, their technology can help. But in, even in those cases where technology is your friend in identifying and being able to trace, are you then going to count on people self-isolating when the rest of society has reopened? So I think people buy into and to a limited degree have bought into the idea of staying home because we're all more or less doing it together. But when your colleagues are working and you're isolating because you may have been exposed, you know, I I think it's just, it's just counting on a lot, but then there are also unique issues with technology. As I mentioned, getting people to adopt it. To that point, how realistic do you think it would be just culturally to tie adoption to some sort of incentive. Like in Washington, for example, we're reopening in phases. How realistic do you think it would be to like have moving from phase one to phase two, for example, be contingent upon a certain percentage of the population adopting technology that would trace their location? You know, uh, I think that that incentive model might work culturally because I think now I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of, of completely writing off a cultural shift because these are extraordinary times. I think it'd be quite difficult to implement logistically because how does the enforcement mechanism work? How would you ensure, how would you validate that a certain number of people are using it? So we use counties. That's how our state has done things is we've used counties as a way of splitting the state up into kind of more manageable regions and populations. And I don't know, first of all, people travel across county lines, et cetera. But I also don't know how you could enforce it in an ongoing way. So so even if somehow you could validate it on day one, what happens if people stop using it after a week? Does the county get jerked back into a lower phase until it can revalidate? It would seem pretty unwieldy. I think the metrics that we're using now can kind of be a proxy for various types of interventions. So they're neutral as to how the county gets there, more or less, right? But they are things like, okay, what's your caseload? What's your capacity in, you know, your health system, et cetera. And those are pretty neutral as to whether you got there through, you know, masks, whether you got there through 
staying shut down really consistently or whether you somehow got a really uh, a loyal test trace isolate population. Right. So it's result based, not necessarily dependent on means, the means. Yeah, it's not really focused. That's that's because I don't think that there's. Um, I just think it'd be very hard. No, I think with if you did it based on masks, I think it would be quite easily enforceable because you know you could just say we will we will let any county reopen where you know that every business in that county is responsible for people wearing masks and and you've seen businesses voluntarily do that already. But I think it's important to say that not any mask would do because if we really want to reopen and feel comfortable, it can't just be you know cloth masks are helpful. And and they're they're better than nothing, but I think if we want the general population to go back to quote unquote normal, you'd need a surgical grade mask. You need something that has some kind of a, a filtration. Are masks entirely optional right now in Washington? They are now mandated for certain types of businesses to reopen under the phased approach, like retail stores. Yeah, like in in certain retail settings, in certain clinics, you know, elective medical environments, in religious faith services, things like that. So they have been mandated, you know, in certain conditional settings. If you want to reopen, if you want to graduate and reopen these types of businesses, this is a condition for those businesses to reopen. And similarly, there's restrictions on how many people as a percentage of capacity could be in a certain business, et cetera. There was for a time, for a brief time, the governor had mandated that restaurants that were reopening in rural areas would have to keep a log of everybody for the purpose of facilitating contact tracing. And that was done away with pretty quickly. Can you speak to why? Because of privacy concerns. I think there was just severe pushback from the restaurants, presumably on behalf of their patrons, but maybe also, you know, on their own, their own sake. So it was, yeah, it was, it was barely in place. It's interesting because I went out to lunch for the first time in four months last week. And after placing my order, the restaurant asked for my phone number. So I started to ask questions about what it would be used for and how long they keep it and who will have access to it. But at the end of the day, I handed it over because for me, the balance between privacy and, you know, public health and safety right now just tips in favor of health and safety. Yeah. I just think we have, I think we have the means to use prophylactic, you know, very low tech intervention in the form of mass. I think we have the means to actually prevent the disease from spreading in almost every environment such that, you know, you really wouldn't need to go that route. You know, in other words, you only need to do that if you feel reasonably confident the disease is spreading. And I think we should just make it our policy that we will reopen only under circumstances where the disease is not spreading. Now, it's not to say that in certain situations, tracing would not be a useful thing if there were some kind of a super spread event. So for example, I'm very worried about what the effect of pepper spray and tear gas and these things are having right now on protesters, many of whom wear masks, but some of whom don't wear masks. And even if they're wearing masks, you know, they're coughing and eyes are tearing and all these kinds of things. And so I'm very worried about what we're going to see as a result of these protests. And in that type of environment, certainly it's extraordinary. It's not something that we would have planned for in our phased approach. But in that situation, it'd be great if we had a mobile app where everyone that was there could kind of be identified. But you could also understand why the people who go to that kind of a protest would be exactly the kind of people who wouldn't want that, right? If you're protesting law enforcement and you feel like, you know, you can't trust uh, the authorities, you seem like a prime candidate to be suspicious of contact tracing app. That's where I think there is an opportunity and understand that there are limitations, but I think there is an opportunity to educate the public about how these apps work. And for apps that are built on the new Google Apple API that was just released, I think people might change their, the calculus of whether or not they're willing to download and use an app like this when they understand the limited amount of data that's being collected and the fact that it's not being stored in a database maintained by the government 
So I think there is a gap in understanding between what the public thinks is happening versus how many of these apps are being built with strict privacy requirements in mind. Yeah, I think, you know, here's our problem. I mean, let me speak specifically to our state. You know, you, you may have heard that we had a major attack of our unemployment insurance system by foreign criminals who were able to use the, uh, essentially, was, you know, I, ID theft and use the identification of Washingtonians to try to defraud Washington State. And we're still in the process of recovering money. We've, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And as a result of that, there are hundreds of thousands of Washingtonians who still have not got, I think I saw, there's still 90,000 Washingtonians who have not gotten their unemployment insurance checks from a couple months ago. Now, and that's a department that Susie Levine, who is a Microsoft alum and very tech savvy, former ambassador, is leading. And, you know, despite having, a, a, you know, a Microsoft alum running that department, there was a major vulnerability and lots of data was compromised. So, you know, it's not a good time right now, I would say, in Washington state to reach out and ask people to trust us with data. I think, you know, your point is, is well taken that these platforms may be quite safe and they may also allow us to avoid the kind of commercial use that uh, people worry about in the private context. But perception is everything. And I think whether it's WikiLeaks or Snowden or our own issues right here, the government has not shown that it's particularly good at safeguarding the data of our constituents. And that, that's really, really unfortunate because there's moments like this when you'd sure like to, to have that credibility. Indeed it is. And because it's such a complicated technical explanation for why these apps, if they utilize the Apple Google API, are privacy protective, and there is actually very little, if any, personal information that would be collected against, you know, the backdrop of, of the narrative that has taken place over the last few years with the data breaches and very little, I think, public confidence in the ability to control their own personal information. It's tough to make that argument because it is so complicated. Yeah. And, and for this to really work, it needs to be broadly deployed. I'm a big believer in you know, the power of, of phenomena, a phenomenon like, like shame, right? So, you know, we hold each other accountable. If somebody walks around, someone goes to a store and they're not wearing a mask. Now, you know, people in Seattle are going to look at that person like, what are you doing? Even if it's not mandated. You know, they're just going to look at that person and people so that we kind of keep each other honest. We keep each other accountable to best practices. And I think, you know, that's another challenge here is that it's not quite as subject to social pressure. It's not visible. Uh, to, you can't, it's not visible, right, you can't right. identify it. And so it's not as easy to have the power of peer pressure work to, to make sure that we have broad adoption. Yeah, it's too abstract and technical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's just not visible the way that wearing a mask is, right? Cyrus, it keeps coming back to the masks. I think this is the answer. Well, I'm telling you, I, I, I'll tell you. And I mean, if someone's got a better idea of how you stop uh, person X from spreading to person Y, which is really, I mean, you know, I, I know I'm making it sound awfully simple, but that's how the virus spreads. It's from the mouth and the nose. So it seems to me like covering the mouth and the nose I know it's not as fancy as what the folks, my friends at Google and Apple can dial up. For sure, it's a very low-tech solution. It does happen to cover the mouth and the nose, however, because I'll ask you guys, I mean, is it your sense that even with a really sophisticated, automated tracing solution, isn't it your sense that you'd still need to reach a sufficient threshold of testing in order to make that work, which is itself quite expensive, far more expensive than masks, but also requires a whole lot of buy-in as well. Oh, absolutely. I was reading about Governor Inslee's 
contact tracing plan for Washington and the fact that it will require between 20,000 and 30,000 tests a day. Right. And when I read that number, all of a sudden felt a little untenable. I mean, that's, that's a lot of testing. Which is, again, a fraction, which is actually a fraction of what, you know, so that's about a million a day nationally. But again, keep in mind that the, the, the best minds out there, whether you look at the Harvard reopening plan or the plan from CAP, the Center for American Progress, or the Volcker plan, I mean, all of these require at least five times that. Think about what it's going to be like during flu season. You're going to rely on just people with, quote unquote, COVID symptoms. You're going to have to test the general population with some regularity to make the tracing meaningful. And so what is the plan in Washington to be able to do that? Well, I'd say right now, we are very gradually reopening. We're advancing counties through the phased approach. And I think there is a little bit of a kind of wait and see mentality. I think we will keep reopening until we start to see spikes and then we'll pull back. And I hope we don't. You know, I hope that somehow something in the ether has changed from March till now. And there's circumstances, who knows, that have changed and will make it different. It does not seem to me like anything has changed. And so my sense is as social distancing relaxes and people start going back and kids start going to school, I think you're going to see, unfortunately, you're going to see numbers go up again. And that's to say nothing of, you know, a second wave that might come, you know, next winter. So right now, I think uh, to be totally honest with you, I think it's we're treading water and maybe we are swimming a little bit. But we're also ready to kind of go back to treading water, all with prayers and hopes that a vaccine will be forthcoming. And I hope everyone listening to this, wherever you're listening to it, will stay safe and healthy and stay positive. Listen to the science. And then only after you listen to the science, listen to your politicians. <laughs> only if they're as smart as you are. This concludes this episode of Privacy versus the Pandemic. Stay tuned for more discussion on these and related topics in future episodes. Visit perkinscooey.com for more information on our privacy practice.